Uh, my talk is uh, called Horizontal Gene Transfer Rescue or Catastrophe. But before we get into that, uh, I want to briefly kind of tell what I uh, like to tell people when they ask me what it actually is I do. And what I think uh, what it is I do is I, I try to simulate microbial ecosystems in, in what I like to call a virtual laboratory. So for example, on the left here, you see these movies, I hope they're working, uh, of uh, microbes that in this case are killing one another uh, via toxin productions and they can be resistant. And you get all these interesting dynamics. Um, and then I study uh, things like genome size evolution, the predictability of evolution, uh, cross-feeding, uh, also as in this movie, antagonistic interactions, um, but also horizontal gene transfer. And that's the topic for today. So a brief introduction, I think many of you will know, but a horizontal gene transfer is um, defined as anything that is not vertical gene transfer. So vertical gene transfer on the left side here of this figure is when um, genes are inherited from parrots to offspring. And then if that gene is beneficial, then that might spread and the, the ancestor will eventually be replaced uh, by this new, new uh, species. And you can also kind of see that here in the tree, but horizontal gene transfer is when um, genes are inherited from anything other than from parents. So for example, from a sister or brother cell, genes can get transferred. And you can see here that the phylogenetic tree is starting to look differently because genes can get lost and regained uh, very rapidly. We now know that this is happening a lot more than we previously thought. So this is not just happening once every blue moon. This is actually, if you look at data from compost communities and soil, there's just an onslaught of horizontal gene transfer by phages and uh, transposons via transformation and of course plasmids. Uh, so we need to understand how this different mode of evolution actually works. Uh, but my question today is more, if there is so much horizontal gene transfer, um, are the bacteria actually somehow benefiting from this horizontal gene transfer, or should we see it merely as a side effect of these selfish genetic elements, such as the phages and the transposome that, that sometimes accidentally transfer a gene? And this is what a title rescue or catastrophe kind of is, is based on. So there is a previous paper, this, this movie I showed you in the introduction, where I already kind of explored this, where I made a spatial model in which I observed that genes for rare ecological opportunities would quote unquote selfishly mobilize themselves, but that this would occasionally actually benefit the host as well. Uh, so that, that's why the selfish here is between quotes, because it's not clear that it's a selfish genetic element, even though they mobilize themselves in this model. And something else that is interesting is that if I did the same thing in a well-mixed implementation of that model, we saw that all the genes simply became full genetic parasites, never actually benefiting the host. Um, so that's an interesting observation to start with, but this was from the perspective of what the genes would want. So we asked the genes, so yeah, you can mobilize yourself, what will happen then? But um, this talk for today, I wanna take the perspective of the host cell. So when would a bacteria actually want to take up DNA, for example, or engage in horizontal gene transfer? So we're gonna start with a very simple model uh, of carrier cells. Uh, can you see my mouse, by the way? I hope you can. Um, carrier cells that carry a beneficial gene uh, that gives a benefit B, and uh, these carrier cells grow faster than non-carrier cells. If the gene is lost via a parameter L, they become a non-carrier and grow slower because they don't have this B here. Uh, but the non-carriers can also interact with carrier cells with rate H times the, uh, how many carriers there actually are and become a carrier again. So this, this represents the horizontal gene transfer. Um, we assume here that the horizontal gene transfer actually comes with a cost for the cell. So these are from the same species. They have the same rate H of horizontal gene transfer. And we assume that lowers their growth rate here. Phi is their growth rate. It lowers their fitness. And then we have a well-mixed model and we dilute by the total growth rate. So we can do simple analysis on this. So question one is uh, depending on B, so the benefit of this trait that the carrier cells are carrying, how many carrier cells are there actually in the population? And depending on other parameters as well, of course. So if a gene is very beneficial, what you will see is that of course, most of the cells will be a carrier cell. It's a very good gene, so why not? And then if you go from without horizontal gene transfer to here with horizontal gene transfer, a few non-carrier cells may be transformed into carrier cells because of, uh, because of the horizontal gene transfer. 
but not a lot. As you can see, the difference here is, is quite small. But if you then go to a slightly beneficial gene, for example, all the way at the bottom here, we see that without horizontal gene transfer in this model, all the cells are non-carriers because the gene is lost and selection is not very efficient because the B is so small. So eventually all of the carrier cells, even if you start with only carrier cells, will become non-carriers. But then if we introduce horizontal gene transfer into this model, we see that a some subset in steady state of the population will be a carrier cell. But now the question becomes, okay, but what about the growth rate? So here I'm just showing how many carriers there are. I'm not showing what the growth rate of the population actually is. And as I said, yes, they have more carrier cells here, but we also said that horizontal gene transfer comes at a cost. So when you do this analysis, uh, what, you, what we show is that we can find distinct classes of genes. If a gene is very beneficial, we call them indispensable genes. These genes, um, horizontal gene transfer is neither required nor beneficial for the population. So this inset over here showed on the x-axis raw horizontal gene transfer rate and the y-axis the average growth rate of the population or the total growth rate of the population, I should say. And you see that just fitness just goes down simply because yes, you get maybe a couple of extra carriers by investing in horizontal gene transfer, but it, it, the difference is just very small. So investing in transfer is costly. But then the more interesting bit is these more slightly beneficial genes. So this, these over here, where you can see that for some intermediate horizontal gene transfer rate, growth is actually uh, optimal. And my favorite class is the rescuable gene, I think, because without horizontal gene transfer, the gene would not even be in the population. So this represents this part of the diagram here. But then if they invest in horizontal gene transfer, then the growth rate is higher um, and um, the gene can persist. So that, that's, that's interesting, I think. So then the question becomes, um, could maybe uh, mutants that invest in horizontal gene transfer invade into a population of uh, cells that do not in, uh, have horizontal gene transfer. Um, for the rescuable gene class, you can already kind of see that this gives kind of a dilemma because if you start here with without horizontal gene transfer, then the entire population has a growth rate of one because everyone is a, is a non-carrier cell or one minus, minus the cost, I should say. Every, but that's zero because they're not investing in horizontal gene transfer. So it's just one. Um, but as you can see, there is one problem. First of all, if you would incrementally increase horizontal gene transfer rate, they first would need to go down in fitness before they go up. But that's actually not the main problem, because even if I assume that they would immediately jump onto this optimal rate of horizontal gene transfer, what you observe in this model is that, um, for example, here, I uh, immediately transfer 20% of the population into this um, HGT plus mutants, and they would still not invade. The reason being that there are not many donors that carry this gene, so there's no one to pick up this gene from. So it's not actually useful to, in the steady state of population that does not have the gene, it's not useful to invade. While if you, you know, assume that a lot of mutants appear at the same time, so 40% of the population, then they manage because then they carry their own gene with them and then they can uh, share this gene uh, in between. But what you can see here is what ecologists call a classical uh, Ali effect, namely the, um, the, the trait already needs to be present for the trait to be beneficial. So there's a, a kind of a catch-22 here. Um, horizontal gene transfer is necessary for these rescuable genes to persist in the population, but the gene needs to be present for horizontal gene transfer to be beneficial. So that's kind of paradoxical. paradoxical. So now we're going to move to an individual-based eco-evolutionary model because this was all well mixed. And of course, I, I really like spatial models. So we made a spatial implementation, which is pretty much the same. So the colors are also the same. Purple are non-carriers, green are carrier cells. And the differences are that there, are now, there is now local reproduction. So they um, compete for uh, produ reproduction in a grid of three by three. Um, and also horizontal gene transfer is local. So they may pick up a gene from somewhere nearby uh, by taking it up from the environment. Uh, and then there, we assume that there's individual differences in fitness and horizontal gene transfer rate because we now assume that each individual has its own unique horizontal gene transfer rate that can evolve. So we just say, okay, these mutate up on reproduction and we just wanna see what happens. Uh, especially we wanna see if they, if they are able to evolve the ability to rescue these rescuable genes, which the mathematical model showed would be very uh, hard. So now there should be a movie here. Um, I think it's gonna appear any second now. Yeah, okay. So 
what I first do in this movie is just run the movie without actually introducing these 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 mutants that that uh, have the carrier gene. And what you can then see is that for a long time the horizontal gene transfer rate remains very low, and that's because well there are no carriers, so there, there is no use to being a horizontal gene transfer plus mutant in this case. It's just kind of a control. And now from time point 50,000, we're gonna start introducing carrier cells into this population. And what you can first see is that not, it won't happen immediately that like um, HDT plus mutants still can't invade as we have also, also observed in the mathematical model. But after a while, uh, it might take some time. In this case, it, it takes quite a bit of time. But then we see that a gene sharing uh, community actually emerges, as you can see over here. And you can also see that the horizontal gene transfer rate shown here on the right um, is actually uh, elevated and higher. And then if you kind of skip to the end of this movie, what you can see is that the entire population has become uh, HDT plus or almost the entire population because they're all bright, which is here the legend, the bright things have horizontal gene transfer, or you can also see it here uh, in the color bar. So how is it that in this spatial implementation of the model, it did evolve while the mathematical model said it couldn't? Well, there could be two reasons for this. First, it could be spatial structure, or it could be stochasticity because this model is also not deterministic while the mathematical model was deterministic. It turns out that spatial structure is actually uh, the, the reason and not stochasticity. So what we did is we also ran this for a well mixed uh, implementation of the individual based model and we still would see that it would fail to invade. So we start introducing these rescuable genes in the population and hope they would pick up on it and in, uh, elevate their horizontal gene transfer rate, but they couldn't. As you can see here over time, everything stays pink, so, the so they cannot spread this green gene here. However, in the spatial implementation, which is kind of what I just showed you, they are able to do this because of this local nucleation event of a small population that can shuttle the gene between these slow, uh, small uh, community. Okay, so is everything better in space? Um, no, because the spatial model also can have very strong selfish genetic elements in them, and that would not be possible in the well mixed case either. So here I start introducing actually bad genes, so genes actually that have a negative effect of 0 0.04, while the benefit of the gene that they're sharing is 0 0.03. So you would think this gene is so bad that maybe uh, the population would not invest in horizontal gene transfer anymore because on average you would expect well you don't want this selfish genetic elements so they might uh, disappear but what you see is that selfish genetic elements invade and persist but you also see that the population here still maintains a relatively high rate of horizontal gene transfer and that is because if you look at the spatial distribution of of this model you can see that there are patches where there is uh, no selfish genetic elements in the environment and patches where there's a lot of selfish genetic elements in the environment so here you would expect the horizontal gene transfer rate to go down while somewhere else bacteria are not actually experiencing this problem. So they're evolving it up again. Uh, and this in the long term, even if I stop introducing selfish genetic elements, you can see it for a long term, they also have to cope with all these selfish genetic elements. So to answer the question that I introduced this talk with, horizontal gene transfer rescue or catastrophe, and I'm gonna answer it in the most millennial way possible with the GIF. Okay, so I hope that GIF worked. Um, so thank you for your attention. I hope I kind of uh, kept the 15 minute um, deadline. I wanna talk, ta thank a few collaborators of this project, Nobuto Takeuchi, Hilja Dukas, and Pauline Hogeweg. Thank you. <laughs>